In wrestling, so much can change as a result of one incident. Injuries and suspensions can derail a wrestler's push, while a backstage moment can create a push. A match and a single tweet can help spawn a promotion. These are examples of the butterfly effect, which suggests that a change in one small event can have a big impact, leading to a much larger event taking place down the line. In our last video, we saw how John Cena's freestyle at the back of the bus on a European tour was seen by the right person and ended up spawning a gimmick that helped Cena reach the main event. We also saw how one tweet set up a chain reaction of events that changed the wrestling world forever, leading to the creation of AEW. And in one of the most emotional moments in recent history, we saw how an unfortunate injury to Mustafa Ali ultimately led to the rise of Kofi Mania. So join us as in this video, we look at five more crazy butterfly effect stories in wrestling. Before we get into the list, this video is kindly sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. If you haven't yet heard of the game, I can only assume you've been living under a rock. The basic premise is what happens if you cross a blockbuster movie with a real AAA game and then squeeze it into a mobile phone. Raid is full of super tough bosses that drop some amazing rewards if you're able to take them out. Let's see who you'll be up against. Dragon. This dragon will eat you alive if you're not prepared. Ice Golem. With his two buddies in tow, this frosty foe will freeze you solid. Spider. This spider queen can spawn other small spiders which she can then feed on to heal herself. And then we have my favorite boss, the Fire Knight, a giant flaming knight with a humongous shield. It's like playing a game of dodgeball with a really good player who can catch a ball and throw it back at you. Sometimes he might attack really hard and other times he might use his special abilities to try and outsmart you. But if you and your team can figure out his weaknesses and work together, you can beat him and earn some awesome rewards. Love is in the air, even in the world of Raid. New players can enjoy a special Valentine's Day themed adventure with the Raid Love Quest. All you need to get involved is to download Raid Shadow Legends from the links below, copy your in-game player ID and then head to raidlovequest.plarium.com. There, enter your player ID and set out on this heartfelt quest running from February 14th to March 14th. Play one of the Valentine's themed mini games for a chance to win fantastic in-game and real life prizes, including Valentine's Day themed raid champions and even Amazon gift cards worth up to $1,000. So if you haven't started playing raid yet, click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen and you'll get unique bonuses worth $35. We're talking a free epic champion Jotun, 100k silver, 50 gems and two epic skill tomes so that you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. Available for 30 days for new players only and it's that easy so I'm sure I'll be seeing you in the game. Now back to the video. The curtain call leads to Austin's push. After signing contracts with WCW, Diesel and Razor Ramon bowed out of the WWF in May 1996 with both of their final matches taking place on a Madison Square Garden house show. Following the main event, Diesel and Razor said farewell to the WWF fans alongside fellow members of the clique, Shawn Michaels and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. With all four men sharing a moment in the ring together in what would become known as the curtain call. It was a rare sight to see baby faces and heels being friendly with each other like this, so upon seeing this, the fans in the building reacted in a big way, while also saying goodbye to Diesel and Ramon. Despite the click getting permission from Vince McMahon, the kayfabe breaking nature of the curtain call caused uproar backstage. This forced McMahon's hand into punishing at least one person from the group, and since Razor and Diesel were gone, and Michaels was a top star and current WWF champion, the person that ended up being punished was Hunter Hearst Helmsley. It caused such an uproar that Vince had to do something about it. And the next day, um, he did something to me about it. Helmsley had been penciled in to win that year's King of the Ring tournament, where Helmsley would have received a push off the back of his victory. But following the curtain call, this plan was erased. Helmsley was instead moved down the card for several months. The King of the Ring crown and subsequent push was instead given to Stone Cold Steve Austin, who upon winning the tournament, delivered one of wrestling's most iconic promos. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. When it came to creative, Austin wasn't an overnight success following King of the Ring, but he continued to make waves before kicking into high gear at the end of 1996, wrestling an exceptional match against Bret Hart at the Survivor Series, and then winning the 1997 Royal Rumble after Austin last eliminated the Hitman. This set up another match pitting the two against each other at WrestleMania 13. The plan had initially been for Bret to face Shawn Michaels at Mania in a rematch from the previous year's show. However, Michaels' apparent injury resulted in the Heartbreak Kid being replaced with Austin, making this the second second time in less than a year that Austin stepped into a big role despite not being the original first choice. Many have speculated that Michaels feigned the severity of his injury so that he didn't have to lose to Brett. I was told 
in August that it was me and Sean at WrestleMania 13. You know, he was going to retire because of his knee. It just seemed so uh, made up at the time. Austin was put in a career-defining performance against Brett. And if it wasn't already clear that Austin was a force to be reckoned with, then this match more than proved it. One year later, the Austin era officially began as he captured his first WWF championship, defeating Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 14, the very man that Austin took the place of at the previous year's WrestleMania. Stone Cold benefited from Hunter Hearst Helmsley's punishment from the curtain call in 1996, and then took advantage of Shawn Michaels' injury in 1997. Austin's King of the Ring trial and more specifically his WrestleMania 13 performance served as launching pads that rocketed the rattlesnake to the very top of the industry. Alundra Blaze's firing influences the screw job and Mr. McMahon. In 1995, the WWF were in financial trouble and as a result were forced to cut back on numerous expenses. This included the talent roster with Vince McMahon making a business call to strip back the women's division, allowing the women's champion Alundra Blaze contract to expire in the process. This angered Blaze who left the company with a title belt still in her possession due to the company forgetting to ask her to give it back. Her release acted as the beginning of a series of events that ended up affecting the wrestling world in a big way. Although Alundra eventually came to terms with Vince's decision to let her go, it still left a sour taste in her mouth. So upon signing for WCW and re-adopting the name Medusa, she made it known to WCW president Eric Bischoff that she still had the WWF women's title. Eric wasted little time in debuting Medusa, booking her to appear on the December 18th, 1995 Nitro, where she opened the show by taking the WWF women's title and throwing throwing it into the trash can, creating one of WCW's most shocking moments. Medusa's trashing of the title proved to be a massive shot fired in the Monday Night Wars, and her appearance on Nitro also influenced Vince McMahon's decision two years later to orchestrate wrestling's biggest screw job. That set off a chain of events behind the scenes as well as what you saw play out on camera. WWF champion Bret Hart was unwilling to drop the title to arch rival Shawn Michaels, since Michaels had previously said he wouldn't do the same for Bret. McMahon believed Bret was the one being unreasonable, so Vince instead agreed to screw Bret out of the title, calling for the bell when Michaels had Bret in the sharpshooter, despite Hart never submitting. Bret had been booked to retain the championship as a result of a disqualification, only for him to be screwed instead. But had Bret retained, many have said McMahon was afraid of Bret Hart showing up on WCW with the WWF title just like Medusa did with the women's belt in 1995. The Medusa incident had proved Bischoff couldn't be trusted and Eric's subsequent acts of giving away finishes to WWF's taped shows live on Nitro proved even further that Bischoff would do whatever it took to get one over the WWF to maintain WCW's advantage. A week after Survivor Series, Vince was interviewed on Raw where he doubled down on the screw job, stating he was left with no choice but to do what he did, pinning the blame fully on Bret Hart with the famous line, Bret screwed Bret. Bret screwed Brett. I have no sympathy whatsoever for Brett. The implications of this interview were massive. McMahon had just made himself the biggest heel in the business. The WWE audience was bull at Mr. McMahon for what had happened. I know. I'll be who they want me to be. Sure, the WWF had lost arguably their biggest star, but in the process, they had gained perhaps their greatest villain as the McMahon character was born. And it was just one month later that Vince would introduce the Attitude Era, a move to an edgier and risque product that ultimately defeated WCW once and for all, with McMahon's feud versus Stone Cold Steve Austin being one of the key ingredients that made fans switch over to WWF Raw. This brings us back to when Alundra Blaze was told her WWF contract wasn't going to be renewed. It sparked an incredible chain reaction of events from Alundra showing up on Nitro and throwing the WWF women's title in the trash to fire one of the first major shots at the WWF in the ratings war to the WWF screwing Bret Hart in fears of Eric Bischoff once again sticking it to the company on TV as he did with Medusa to the creation of the Mr. McMahon character as a result of screwing Bret all the way to the Austin vs. McMahon feud that helped the WWF defeat and conquer WCW in the Monday Night Wars. Jeff Jarrett being owed money leads to the launch of TNA. Next we have another example of a wrestler needing leaving the WWF while still one of the company's champions. But to understand this case, we first have to go back to 1998 and the start of 1999, when Jeff Jarrett felt he had been shortchanged in terms of pay on multiple house show loops and pay-per-views, as his pay had been disproportionate compared to the wrestlers he'd been working with at the time. Then towards the end of 1999, the WWF were unwilling to give Jarrett a raise on his current contract, which was set to expire. I thought I was gonna get a big bump in pay, I'll say that diplomatically. 
and that just wasn't coming. This meant Jeff had leverage over the WWF since he was going into his final night with the company at No Mercy as Intercontinental Champion, made worse by the fact that Jarrett chose to sign with WCW the next day. Comparisons can be drawn to our previous example with Medusa and the Women's Championship, and especially Bret Hart and the WWF Championship, as Vince was once again put in an unenviable situation. McMahon either had to pay up or risk the consequences. Head of talent relations Jim Ross believed $150,000 was a suitable compromise between the WWF and Jarrett. However, Jeff wanted that number doubled to make up for the money he lost when the company made him take a pay cut in 1998. Due to missing a large number of live events in 97 and 98, as a result of Jeff staying home to take care of his wife who was recovering from cancer. We're thinking 150. I said, Jim, let's double that. And get me to 300. The WWF had no choice but to agree to Jarrett's terms or risk him not working the show. Jeff didn't unpack his bags from his car until a deal was reached. Once the two parties came to an agreement and Jarrett brought his stuff into the building, it was the job of Mark Carano to follow Jeff and the Intercontinental title just in case Jarrett left with the belt. On the pay-per-view, Jeff defended the title against China in a good housekeeping match. Double J ended up losing, meaning China was the new Intercontinental Champion. The next night, Jarrett appeared on WCW Nitro attacking Buff Bagwell with a signature guitar shot. The next time Jarrett was brought up on WWF television was when Vince McMahon fired Double J on the night of the Raw Nitro simulcast in 2001 after Vince had bought WCW. The public firing was McMahon's way of getting back at Jarrett for holding him for money two years prior. Capital G, double O, double N, double E. Gone. There was no chance of Jarrett returning to the WWF, who now had no competition following the acquisition of WCW. Jarrett instead started up a new promotion, Total Non-Stop Action. Jarrett used the money he received from holding up Vince in 99 to partially fund TNA. The company emerged as a challenger brand to the WWE, where we would see plenty of familiar faces. TNA also allowed new up-and-coming talents to ply their trade and make a name for themselves. All in all, WWF's decision to shortchange Jarrett and then reduce his salary ultimately had a much bigger impact than anyone would have thought. Jarrett's decision to hold up the WWF for the money he was owed meant that there was no hope of the company bringing him back after WCW folded. But from there, Jarrett started his own promotion to slot in as the number two wrestling company in an example of one of wrestling's most unique butterfly effects. Matt Hardy's injury results in Edge's rise. In late 2003, Matt Hardy made the jump to Raw from SmackDown in order to be on the same brand as his girlfriend, Lita, who had recently returned from injury. Over the next number of months, the two appeared on television together, featuring in a storyline with Kane. However, However, things began to stall for Matt after he suffered a torn ACL in the summer of 2004. This ruled him out indefinitely while Lita continued her storyline with Kane. The injury alone will have already been a big blow for Hardy, but it would end up having much bigger implications as the months progressed. To save herself from going on the road alone, Lita began traveling with Edge, a good friend of hers and Matt's. Lita and Edge gradually became closer and closer, leading to the two having an affair that Matt eventually found out about. This caused trouble behind the scenes between the three that affected things at work and came to a head when Matt Hardy was released from his WWE contract on April 11, 2005. This came after Edge had his tires slashed following a house show in the Carolinas. They thought that I automatically either did it, I didn't. The office, I think that was the final straw and like saying that there was gonna be too much trouble and that I was gonna end up being released. Loud, you screwed Matt chants rang out during an in-ring segment involving Lita. Lita would then become romantically involved with Edge on television, which only added further fuel to the real-life fire while also enraging fans even more, to the point where the demand for Hardy to come back couldn't be ignored. That's a man's wife! What the hell are you people thinking here? This return came to fruition on the July 11th Raw with Matt returning to attack Edge whilst being restrained by security. Adam, you bastard! And Lita, you whore! Hardy, Edge and Lita's real life drama began to play out on screen with the infamous Bite This interview that gave fans a peek behind the curtain which put even more heat on Lita and Edge. When I was out hurt, you stupid bastard, you lying coward, what did you do? You did everything you could do to get inside my girl's head and inside her pants. The feud spawned a series of memorable matches including the cage match at Unforgiven 2005 and the Loser Leaves Town ladder match on the Raw Homecoming show. The ladder match acted as the culmination of the Love Triangle storyline but for Edge, this was only the beginning of his rise the top. With Lita by his side, he became the rated R superstar, a character built on sex and violence. But it wouldn't have been as effective without Lita, who added another dimension to Edge's character. If there was such a thing as a missing ingredient to Edge's character, she was it. I think it brought them both 
to the next level. A missing piece that finally propelled him to the main event, where he won the WWE Championship for the first time in his career. Edge and Lita continued to feature in risque segments, cementing themselves as one of the WWE's greatest ever couples. And even after Lita's retirement and the couple's real-life split, Edge remained a major player, racking up more and more world titles. Matt Hardy's injury in 2004 put a strain on he and Lita's relationship that Edge took advantage of. Then, when reality blurred into storyline, Edge embraced the heat, becoming one of WWE's most hated heels along with Lita, a pairing that proved to be a key component in Edge's rise to the main event. Roman Reigns' illness leads to a title unification and WrestleMania problem. WWE's day one event in 2022 was to have two massive title encounters. Big E was set to defend his WWE Championship in a fatal four-way, while Roman Reigns would defend his Universal Championship versus Brock Lesnar. However, on the day of the event, it was revealed that Roman Reigns had to pull out the show due to illness. To counteract this, the WWE instead added Lesnar to the WWE title match, making it a five-way. Lesnar would go on to win the match, becoming the new WWE Champion. Brock and Roman were still to have their big match against one another though, and this took place in the main event of WrestleMania 38. Given that both men went into the bout, each holding a world championship, their clash was dubbed as winner take all, meaning the victor on the night would be declared the undisputed WWE Universal Champion. Roman Reigns earned this honor by defeating Lesnar. Reigns would now defend both belts as one title going forward. It was reported that the titles were unified in order to allow Reigns to appear on both Raw and SmackDown more often. Reigns was now on both shows, but his appearances on television as a whole became less and less frequent, while his matches were almost exclusively saved for pay-per-view. As this was happening, Cody Rhodes had just returned to WWE to much fanfare. Cody made it his mission to capture the WWE Championship in order to succeed where his father failed, although a torn peck halted these plans. Back over on SmackDown, the Bloodline storyline was heating up with Sami Zayn attempting to join the group. This story was played out over several months, getting better and better each week, in no small part thanks to Sami. It was just brilliant to see the slow burn of Zayn trying to become a member of the Bloodline and then being made an honorary use, only to fail his final test because he didn't want to hurt his best friend. Sami had been a great babyface in his first years in WWE, but his work with the Bloodline had taken him to the next level. He just hasn't been very oozy. This made his official face turn at the Royal Rumble so much sweeter. Fans were now clamoring to see Zayn receive a title shot against Roman Reigns, and they wanted it to happen in the main event of WrestleMania. The problem with this was that Cody Rhodes had made his triumphant return from injury by winning the 2023 Men's Royal Rumble, meaning the American Nightmare would be the one closing out WrestleMania to challenge Roman for the undisputed WWE Universal title. This created an interesting situation. Fans were overjoyed to see Cody return and absolutely wanted him to capture the World Championship, but the amazing story that had been told with Roman Reigns, Sami Zayn, and the Bloodline deserved to culminate in the main event of the grandest stage of them all. This brings us back to Reigns falling ill and missing the day one event, where his scheduled opponent on that show, Brock Lesnar, ended up winning the WWE Championship, setting up a unification bout at WrestleMania 38. Had the titles not been unified, then it's very possible we could have seen Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn main event night one of WrestleMania for the Universal title, while Cody Rhodes could have closed out the other night, challenging for the WWE Championship. It would have made sense for Rhodes to challenge the WWE title holder, since Cody made it clear in his first return promo back in 2022 that it was his mission to become WWE Champion. Sami Zayn got his singles match versus Roman Reigns at the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. Sami received the perfect hometown reception from the Montreal crowd. but Zayn ultimately came up short on the night. Sami was in the right place at the wrong time. And while he could still get his big win against Roman down the line, it won't be at WrestleMania, be in a one-on-one -on -one match or a three-way, as the WWE would be going ahead with their original plan for the WrestleMania main event with Cody Rhodes wrestling Roman Reigns in a singles match for the undisputed Universal Championship. Reigns' illness set off the butterfly effect that led us to the point where Romans eventually had two viable challengers for WrestleMania 39, but only one championship to defend. And that brings us to the end of this video. As always, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you like this one, be sure to check out our first installment of five crazy butterfly effect stories in wrestling. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.